Hi guys, welcome back to your online antenatal education videos. Um, so today we're going to be talking about multiple pregnancies. So this video isn't uh, going to relate to most of you because um, we know that um, actually multiple pregnancies are few and far between. Um, but for those of you that are watching, hopefully this video is going to give you so much information about um, your antenatal care, planning for birth, postnatal care and feeding your twins or triplets. So as always, we're going to get up the uh, screen share um, and we have our PowerPoint. So Amy's going to kick things off to start with, talking a bit about um, twins and triplets, so the chorionicity um, of your babies. Uh, and then once she's talked a bit about that, I'm going to then move on and talk to you a bit about premature birth, um, birth in general and postnatal care. So I'll pass over to Amy now, who's going to start us off today. Thank you, Laura. Lovely. OK, so multiple pregnancy is generally described um, for women who are having more than one baby. So today we're going to be mostly talking about twins, um, but this does apply to, to triplets as well. So um, most multiple pregnancies are completely normal and healthy. Um, and you follow the same kind of advice and information that we give to women who are having a singleton pregnancy or, or only having one baby. However, there is um, a slightly increased risk of complications when you are, are carrying more than one baby. Um, and we'll go on to that in, in a moment. So because of this, you um, generally have lots more regular antenatal care. You'll see your midwife and your consultant much more regularly during your pregnancy. Um, and you're, you generally have um, more scans as well. So I'm just going to go on to chorionicity. Um, and that's a long word. Um, it sounds quite complicated, but I'm going to explain it to you um, as best I can. OK, so twins or triplets can either be dichorionic or monochorionic. Okay, so dichorionic, I'm just gonna flip this over so I can show you some pictures. So dichorionic twins are down here, and it means that they have got their own placentas. So there are two placentas, and this is diamniotic and dichorionic. So diamniotic means that they have their own amniotic sacs. So they each have their own. And dichorionic means that, oh, Going on a little bit more. Dichorionic means that they have their own placentas. So they are both self sufficient within your tummy. Okay. Monochorionic twins. So this one up here is monoamniotic and monochorionic, which means that they share a placenta and they also share their amniotic sac. So they are, they are sharing everything between themselves. Um, another monochorionic. Um, pregnancy could be that you have a diamniotic pregnancy with a monochorionic. So they are sharing a placenta, but they have got their own amniotic um, sacs that they're in separately. So you can see it sounds quite complicated, but when we break it down, it's actually not too bad. Um, with chorionicity for triplets, it's slightly different. You can have trichorionic twins, which um, each baby has their own placenta and dichorionic triplets who have um, two of the three babies share a placenta and chorion and the third baby is separate or you can have monochorionic triplets and all of them share a placenta and a chorion so um i hope that wasn't too too difficult to understand i'll put this back up again obviously these slides on this video will be um up up on our Facebook page for, for a while, um, but we'll also be sharing these slides at the end of, of our series so that you can have them um, to hand. But if you're, you're seeing your midwife and you're consulted regularly, so if, if this is a little bit difficult to understand, you can ask them to break it down a little bit more. Generally, monochorionic twins are the more risky of the twins because they are sharing their, their food and their oxygen supply. They're sharing their placenta. So they're slightly more high risk. And these are the, the babies that you'd be um, having lots of scans and making sure that their growth um, is good. And this is the reason why, because in monochorionic pregnancies, um, there is um, a condition called twin to twin transfusion. 
And if, if it's going to occur, it generally occurs between 14 and 24 weeks of pregnancy, but it can, it can happen later on. And I'm just going to show you this picture here. This is a good example of twin to twin transfusion. You can see these babies are sharing their placenta. And this baby is particularly bigger than, than this baby. And that's because the twi this twin is getting all the um, nutrients and the um, oxygenation from the placenta and this twin isn't getting so much. So it's an unbalanced blood flow between the babies. And if this is occurring, regular scans um, of the baby's growth and, and the amniotic fluid is um, how, how we detect this and how we can treat it. Um, there'd be an individual plan for you um, via your fetal medicine team um, and if there are any concerns at all then that you'll be very closely monitored by them. So any sign, the, the signs of this kind of thing happening would be a sudden increase in the size of your abdomen. So if, you're, if you feel that your bump has got particularly big very quickly and it feels tense and a little bit painful um, then you must um, get in contact with our day unit and the number is down here. Um, the day unit number is here. You would need to phone them and be seen um, by one of our consultants. Okay, and over to Laura for premature birth. Now, um, as you are carrying more than one baby, it is likely um, that your labour may start earlier than a woman carrying just the one baby. Um, now, sometimes it can be so early that the health of your babies may be affected. Now, there at the moment isn't any known interventions proven to prevent your body going into labour early, particularly in uh, twin pregnancies. But sometimes it is actually possible for us to try and stop your labour um, from progressing if it does start. Now, the ways that we would do that will be discussed with you at the time on an individual basis. Now, as Amy said, um, if you were ever to have any concerns about um, any of the symptoms for twin to twin transfusion or similarly any signs of premature birth, you must mask mask during the day unit. Because what can happen in the day unit is, is you will be seen uh, by an obstetrician and a midwife who will then make the best plan of care for yourself and your babies. Now, that may be trying to stop the labour if it is really quite premature. Um, or if you're actually over a certain point where they think these babies could tolerate, um, you know, being earthside at this point, then they may just let your body carry on naturally. But if um, we're going to try and stop your labour, or actually if we're going to let it carry on, there is treatment that we can give to you um, to prepare your baby's lungs for birth. Now that treatment is in the form of a steroid. And these steroids are given via injection to you into your leg. We give um, two doses. We give um, the first dose when we know that your body is going into labour. And then the second dose, if you haven't already given birth, 12 hours later. And it's known that those two um, injections of steroids can um, help to prepare um, the baby's premature lungs um, to start breathing um, once they're born. So as I said, if you think that you're having any painful contractions, um, any show or any waters that you think have broken, you must, must ring the day unit. If um, it is your reality that in fact, it does look like that you're going into labor, as well as seeing our obstetricians in the day unit on labor ward, you may also um, get to speak to the neonatal consultant from our neonatal unit. Now at the moment, because of the current situation it's probably not going to be um, safe for us to have you visit the neonatal unit um, but we'll definitely try and get someone to come and speak to you from the neonatal unit to speak through um, sort of um, the possible outcomes for your babies uh, depending on what gestation you're at um, but it is um, off it is um, it is the case that if your babies are born prematurely, so before 37 weeks, that they may need closer monitoring once they are born. And I'll speak a bit more about that I'm about in the postnatal care section. Um, but thinking about birth, um, so our recommendations for birth. So this is if you're, um, you know, you're at term. Um, so as per our our guidance and our recommendations that around 28 weeks of pregnancy your midwife and your consultant obstetrician from fetal medicine um, 
will start to talk to you about your birth plan. Now, we call this an elective birth. So what that means is that um, you and the, um, and the team of midwives and doctors will have an agreed time when your babies will be born. This really does involve you. These are our recommendations, but obviously it's up for discussion. Um, we'll always make sure that you're fully informed before making your choices. So as you can see here on the slide, so if you're carrying dichorionic twins, so where babies both have their own placenta, we recommend um, an elective birth at 38 weeks. Whereas if you're carrying babies that have the same placenta, we recommend birth at 36 weeks um, of pregnancy. And if you're carrying triplets, we recommend an elective birth at 35 weeks. Now with um, twins, we do, um, in the first case, if your baby is your first baby is presenting head down, so cephalic, we do recommend trying for a vaginal birth. However, if you um, are carrying triplets, we do recommend an elective cesarean section at 35 weeks, or we recommend a cesarean section for twins if your first twin is in the breech position. Um, and Amy's going to show us some pictures to sort of um, show you what those positions look like. I'll show you those positions now. Yeah. Okay, so speak of you. Okay, so this is the first one I'd like to show you. So this is the breach transverse. So this is when your first twin is presenting by its bottom, and the second twin is laying a crossways in your tummy. Okay, so in this situation, um, the recommendation would be um, to have an elective caesarean section unless those babies move. So babies are moving around all of the time, up, right up until about 34 weeks, they're moving around, doing somersaults. After about 34 weeks pregnancy, that's when they're kind of settling down into the position that they're going to be in. So this is the breech transverse position. I'll show you. So 45% of, of twin pregnancies will actually be both head down. So when they, both babies are head down, um, and this is the optimal, obviously the, the optimal position for your twins to be in because twin one, your first twin, will come down nicely with its head on the cervix and then twin two can come head first um, after that twin. So I've got another picture here. So 40% of twin um, pregnancies will be first baby head down, second baby breech. And um, we'll go on to talk a little bit later. If, if, if your first baby is head down and you're, you're a first time parent, mum, then the first baby can be born, um, your cervix will have got to full dilatation and your first baby will be born. And then the second twin, whether it's bottom down or head down, will be able to come behind it quite nicely and that, that's not a problem, a vaginal birth is, is completely um, achievable in this situation. And then of course you have two babies who are breech. So this is a breech and breech presentation uh, where both babies are bottom down and that's about 8% of twin pregnancies. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> I'll come back to the share, share screen now for you, Laura. Thank you. There you go. So obviously, all of your pregnancies, those of you out there who are having twin or triplet pregnancies, all of your pregnancies are going to be different. And your birth is going to be unique and dependent on um, the factors involved um, for you. So we have to take into consideration the well-being of the babies, the position in their uterus, which Amy's talked to you a bit about, um, if you've had any previous pregnancies or births, and of course, your hopes and expectations for birth, because that is just as important in twin and triplet pregnancies as in a singleton pregnancy. We want to make sure that we are making this birth experience one um, that you want it to be. Um, so it's really, really important for you to speak to your doctor and your midwives about your hopes, fears or expectations um, to make sure that we can make you informed um, and prepare and as prepared as possible um, for birth. Um, now, as Amy said, um, in some cases, a cesarean section is necessary, but actually in the majority of cases, vaginal birth is recommended. 
Now, having an elective birth, which we talked about in the previous slide, um, at these times is not thought to have any um, sort of added risk to the health problems for your babies. Um, you can choose not to have an elective birth at these times, as I said, it is just a recommendation. However, um, continuing your pregnancy for longer um, than our recommendation um, of gestation is dependent on positions and how many twins you've got and what chorionicity they have, um, depend, will increase, may increase the risk of complications for your baby, such as uh, stillbirth. So it is really, really important to have those conversations, um, as I've said. Now, your doctor and your midwife should both explain all the risks and benefits um, when they're discussing birth with you. Um, now, thinking about triplets then, um, for any of you out there who are carrying three babies at the moment, uh, I mentioned on the previous slide that we recommend that triplets um, are to be born by caesarean section at 35 weeks um, or for monochorionic mono twins at 36 weeks. Now, you should be offered a course of steroids, which um, I've spoken about um, an ex as an example when we're thinking about premature birth. But if we are planning, your elective birth before 37 weeks of pregnancy, you will, or you should be offered um, the course of steroids as well. Because as I said, prior to 37 weeks, your baby's lungs are still classed as being premature and these steroids will help to mature them so that they um, are able to, um, you know, properly inflate and breathe um, their lungs uh, when they are born. Now, if you choose not to have an elective birth at these times that we are recommended, you, are, you will need to be um, regularly monitored by doctors and midwives to check that your babies are healthy. So what I mean by that is you'll be offered weekly appointments, um, either with your obstetrician that you've been seeing in pregnancy or maybe in the day unit, um, to have monitoring of your baby's heartbeats um, and having ultrasound scans to keep an eye on their growth. Um, and to make sure that their growth and their amniotic fluid level is all within normal limits. Um, because obviously we want to know as soon as possible if anything changes, not only with the checks that we're doing, but also with their movements that you're feeling. Um, because it may be that if there are any changes, we would really um, recommend sort of getting that elective birth um, booked in. Now, if your labor does not happen spontaneously, um, when your babies are due, you may be offered an induction of labor. So by this, we mean if you have not taken up the recommendation for giving birth at um, the gestations that we've discussed, um, then we may be thinking about an induction of labor um, in our induction room on the labor ward. Now, that's all a bit about birth. We're going to move on to postnatal. Oh, no, we're not. Scrap that. <laughs> talking about where you're going to have your babies obviously is really important you want to know where it's going to be happening um so during labor we recommend that your care is undertaken on labor ward now we recommend that this happens or your birth happens on labor ward because you are um considered as having a slightly higher risk pregnancy because you've got two or three babies so our recommendation is is that we have continuous fetal monitoring being carried out throughout your labor and we've spoken a bit about continuous monitoring in our video back in the first stage of labor, um, which is where we have um, sort of the one lead monitoring your contractions. And then we'll have two um, transducers listening into baby's heartbeats because obviously you'll have uh, two babies. And we want to hear them both separately to make sure that they're both um, coping with labor. Now, sometimes if we're unable to really clearly determine which baby is which, we may recommend putting a fetal scalp electrode on the top of baby or twin one's head who is presenting first head down um, because then we can quite clearly hear twin one via the FSC and then twin two on the abdominal transducer um, and sometimes that really helps getting a good clear um, monitoring instead of us really having to keep fiddle, fiddling with your tummy all the time which can become a little bit annoying for you. Um, so we may recommend um, an FSC if monitoring is not clear on the abdominal transducers. Now, we've spoken about the fact that if your twin one is head down, then a vaginal birth is possible. Now, that is because that 
the head of twin one is able to then dilate your cervix to fully dilate it, so 10 centimeters and be born. Now, once that's taken place, your body should and, and hopefully will then allow the second baby to be born either in the cephalic position or um, breech, breech position, which is head down. Now, the birth of twins on the labor ward at Princess Anne tend to take place in our theatres. So you would have your labor um, on our labor ward. Uh, and then when the time comes that you're 10 centimeters and ready to push, we would then transfer you and your birth partner into theaters um, where you could then start pushing. Um, now you may find out that it differs from trust to trust as to how we, um, we carry out the second stage in twins, but at the Princess Anne, we do recommend being in theater for the second stage and birth of your babies. Um, one of our other recommendations at Princess Anne is also that um, during labour you have an epidural for pain relief once you're in established labour. And established labour is once you are four centimetres dilated or if you're contracting every two minutes lasting a good 60 seconds. Now the reasoning for um, our recommendation of epidural as pain relief is that we know around 30 to 40 percent of women with twin pregnancies will end up needing a cesarean section in labor either for uh, suspected distress of one or both of your babies or um, for um, sort of a stalled labor so slightly slower progress than what we'd anticipate labor to normally um, progress at and obviously, if you've already got an epidural sighted, we can then just top up that epidural in theatre um, and use that for the cesarean section. So that's the reasoning behind why we um, recommend an epidural. But obviously, this is all up for discussion with the midwives and doctors who are looking after you. You don't, you know, if you don't want an epidural, if that's not in your birth plan at all, and you just want to crack on and use the gas and air, then you have that discussion with the midwife at the time and the doctors at the time. Because at the end of the day, we can only um, recommend things for you. And you, once you've consented or asked for things, we will, we will then go forth and, and um, give you these pain relief options. Nothing is obviously ever um, forced upon you, um, but we just like to make it clear that this is our recommendation at Princess Anne, um, but it's always up for discussion. Absolutely. So once your babies are born, um, they will hopefully um, be able to stay with you. And we recommend doing skin to skin and all the other great stuff that we um, recommend for singleton pregnancies. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that on the next slide, I think it is. Um, but this is a little bit about triplets. So we recommend that triplets are born by cesarean section and the timing is considered on an individual basis with the doctor who's looking after you in pregnancy. Um, but it's usually at 35 weeks if you haven't gone into labour earlier than that. Um, now, elective cesarean section may also be recommended if your first twin is bummed down um, or um, if it is laying across your tummy, like Amy showed you in those pictures a little bit earlier. Um, now, it is also really important to know that your babies will change positions anywhere up to 34 weeks. Um, so please, please, please don't be massively worried if when you have a scan at say 31 weeks, that one's breech, one's transverse, because you've still got a bit of time for them to do a bit more jigging around and hopefully get themselves into a nice head down um, position. Now, in each of these situations, so um, if your twin one is breech or um, transverse, giving birth vaginally does carry a greater risk to your baby. Um, because obviously, particularly if you're a first time mum, you haven't given birth before. Um, because we do know that uh, twin and triplet pregnancies are a bit more risky. Um, we're not sure as to um, how your body and how your cervix um, would, would cope with a, um, a labour with a baby who's bummed down. So it's really important that you discuss the advantages and disadvantages of an elective section um, and vaginal birth um, with your doctors and midwives. Um, and they'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about this. And there's also a really, really helpful information leaflet that we have from Princess Anne on our website, which I think we'll be able to post the link for. So you can have a little read through that as well. But let's talk about the fun part. So once your babies are actually here, so you've gone through the labor, you've given birth, however, um, 
however it's ended. So if you've had a lovely vaginal birth or a lovely birth in theatre via cesarean section, we're then going to think about the best way to care for your babies postnatally. So as I've said, skin to skin is so, so important. And we did um, a whole video on the golden hour. Um, I think that was a couple of weeks back now. Um, it's just as important with twins and triplets for you to do skin to skin as it is with one baby. Still has exactly the same benefits of helping to regulate their temperature, helping to regulate their breathing and heart rate. It's great for bonding, initiation of breastfeeding. So we're, as midwives looking after you, uh, we are going to be encouraging you to do all of this um, great stuff with your two or your three babies. Um, and what I must add is that when you're being looked after in labour with a twin or a triplet pregnancy, you will have the same, the same midwife leading um, sort of your care during labour and birth into the postnatal, initial postnatal period. It isn't that you're cared for a doctor in labour and the midwife still cares for you um, and will be there by your side as your advocate um, throughout your, um, throughout your labour. Um, so initiating skin to skin. Now, it is really important to know that approximately 40% of babies born following a, um, a multiple pregnancy will need more care um, than can be provided by your bedside on our postnatal ward. So they will receive this care on our amazing neonatal unit. And there are different levels of care which your babies may or may not need. Um, now, the, in the most cases, babies um, need to help just keeping themselves warm, and that is done by having them on the neonatal unit in a little incubator um, and maybe some help with their feeding as well. So some babies need a little feeding tube called an NG tube that goes into their nose, into their tummies, um, and that's the way that we feed them either breast milk or formula milk, however you've decided to feed them. Um, and then some babies may also need further support with things like their breathing. Now, obviously, if any of this is happening to you and your babies, the neonatal team are absolutely fantastic and they will be explaining everything to you that is happening and being recommended for your babies. Also, the midwives looking after you will be in really close contact with the neonatal unit, getting regular updates about your babies and their well-being um, and relaying information to you until you're well enough to go round to the neonatal unit and see them yourself. Because sometimes if they have to go to the neonatal unit quite quickly after birth for support, um, most often you are not in a, in, a, um, in a situation whereby you can go with them straight away. So, for example, if you've just had a cesarean section and the doctors still need to do all your um, sort of stitch you um, doing all their stitches, um, then obviously you're not going to be able to go with them straight away. So it will be that we're going to make sure you're well enough after your cesarean and then get you around there. So we can take you around there on a bed. That's absolutely fine. Um, I've done that quite a few times with ladies um, and the neonatal team are able to make room for you in your bed. Or if you're able to pop yourself into a wheelchair or walk around them, fantastic. You can do that as well. Um, but sometimes the neonatal unit do need a little bit of time just to settle your babies into the unit before you come and visit them, um, just to give them that space that they need to get everything set up um, and ready. Now that's a lot of me talking. <laughs> My turn now, Laura. <laughs> so I'm going to talk um, a little bit more about feeding your babies. And when, we, when we're deciding what we, how we're going to feed our baby, it's one of the most important decisions we can make as parents. Um, breastfeeding makes a really big difference to your health and to baby's health, um, whether you're having a singleton pregnancy or a twin pregnancy. And just because you're having a, a multiple birth doesn't mean that you can't breastfeed. Um, if you decide that you want to do so. So during your pregnancy, your breasts will start to produce colostrum and you can, you can get lots more information about breastfeeding on, um, on our breastfeeding online resources um, with Claire Godden, who we, we talked about these um, sessions a little while, a couple of weeks ago, but we can give you more information about her sessions. Um, so during your pregnancy, you will, you will produce colostrum and everybody produces colostrum at a different point in their pregnancy. So it's hard to tell when, but we, we advise um, people to do something called colostrum harvesting, which is where you hand express your colostrum into small syringes and you save the colostrum for when the babies are born. 
Now, the, the act of, of doing harvest, colostrum harvesting actually promotes a really good um, milk supply once the babies are born. And if we know that babies may, or, or there is a chance that babies could end up on the neonatal unit or could end up needing um, a little bit of extra food by way of, of top up after breastfeeding, then colostrum harvesting is a really fabulous thing to do. So if you're having a multiple pregnancy, I couldn't um, advise you to do that more. Colostrum harvesting is a, a really great thing to do. Um, it takes lots of practice to breastfeed, whether you're having one baby or whether you're having two or three babies. Um, you will have as much support as you can possibly need um, at the Princess Anne. The neonatal team and the, the midwives and the breastfeeding babes team will do everything they can to help you and support you. Most people do generally find that learning how to feed one baby um, with different positions and latching is the key. So if you feed babies one at a time to begin with, and then once you've got the hang of the, the positioning and the latching, you can then tandem feed the babies if you choose to do so. And we can help you with that um, once the babies are here. Um, but lots and lots of midwives happy to help. So if you are choosing to um, bottle feed rather than breastfeed, absolutely fine, not a problem at all. Um, you can speak to your midwives about paste bottle feeding, responsive feeding and sterilization of equipment and making up feeds and that type of thing. What we do suggest though is that if you are bottle feeding the babies um, when you're coming in, to bring two starter packs of the ready made up bottles that you can buy from, from most places. Um, the packs come with pre-made bottles and plastic sterilized teats so that you don't need to worry whilst you're in hospital because we don't we don't have huge amounts of facilities for sterilizing bottles and making up feeds so if you bring two packs of, of um, pre-made milk in that would be fabulous so we've got some useful numbers here that um, you may find useful the fetal medicine team i'm sure you will have received their number already this is the team that will be looking after you in your pregnancy um, the maternity day assessment unit so if you were worried about baby's movements or um, any concerns at all you would phone the day unit or if you felt that you were going into labor or your waters had broken then you would phone the labor line and they would um, advise you what to do next there are also some amazing um, twin associations, twin multiple birth associations locally and nationally. We have the Southampton Twins Club, who we um, work very closely with as a maternity, uh, maternity service. The Multiple Twins Foundation, this is their number and their website. Um, the Twins Trust, which was formerly known as TAMBA, you, you may have heard of them as TAMBA, um, they're a great source of um, information and support and here's their um, website here. And as part of the Twins Trust, they also have um, a twin line, which means that um, if you wanted to speak to um, other parents of, twin, of, of twins or triplets, then you can phone this number free and, confidential, free and confidentially um, between these times, and you can speak to or be put in contact with parents who have been through multiple birth um, and their experiences, and they, um, be able to support and answer any questions that you might have and they have an email here and a website so there's an awful lot of support out there for you um, i know it's a bit of a whistle stop tour um, but if you have any other further in, um, further questions or any concerns at all then please just speak to your consultant or or your midwife and they'll be able to help you out um, okay, so that's the end of, of that episode. So on Monday, we are going to be doing a home birth, um, all things home birth, preparing for a home birth. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about home birth during, um, during this, this, this time of COVID-19 and, and the things that we're trying to do to, to keep facilitating women's choices. Um, so if you are, um, interested in that then have a little watch on monday and we shall look forward to seeing you then take care bye